Okay, are we recording? Audio recording, video recording. Alright. Okay. Cool. I'm with Charles Grace over here. Hello. Okay, so we talked about Sweet Louise and how you were telling it in the perspective of your grandfather. Mm -hmm. And something that I noticed right away is that right after you told me that, you usually write songs about other people. Mm, yeah, yeah, I can't, uh, I don't want to say can't, I, I will just say at this point, um, any love song in particular that I've written has usually been from somebody else's perspective, right? I wrote a song called really Pillow to Post that yeah. was kind of inspired by my brother and his wife's love story. Mm. And then Sweet Louise is inspired by my grandparents' love story. Um, so I'm just, it's a, uh, it's me just kind of unveiling my interest in people watching, I guess. That's cool. <laughs> Is it easier to do that because therefore you're not really like focusing on your own perspective? Um, like why do you do that? You know, because a lot of people when they write about love songs, they talk about their own personal experience. Yeah, and I, you know? I did that and maybe there's a little fear involved. I did that once and mm -hmm. that relationship's no more. So um, I, I, I just really fascinated by it. I really love I love hearing other people's stories. I love um, kind of getting into, especially like those two love stories, like, are very different. But they're also, like, not all sunshine and rainbows. It's right. like, it sounds beautiful and pretty and, like, you know, with, like, anything else, you're hearing the finished product, but there's a lot of, like, right. there's a lot of grinding and, and muck and, you know, getting down in the mud in that, you know, love is not always uh, this, you know, hot pink Cadillac convertible, like, hair in the wind like oh man life's grand you know so it's like with those with those love stories comes you know the uh the not so great stuff too so that's, no, I think that's I what agree. I like about it and uh just to you know relay that to the creative process I feel the exact same way I feel like a lot of people see this finished product and they're like oh this is this looks yep. really cool but there's so much work that right. goes behind the scenes you know like I'm I'm not even I think I'm half the age of my grandparents' entire marriage. <laughs> like, that was just their relationship. You know, so I, I realized that I have to humble myself and say like, this is just an outsider's take. Even even though I'm right. a family member, this is one outsider's take on a relationship that is quite literally above my pay grade. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's very interesting to hear about that or try to relate to that just because we're so young, but also, you know, like, we live in an era where dating is a very interesting anomaly. Um, you know, you're, I'm seeing the the impermanence of relationships now, and just right. how they're casually being treated. And right. you know, I feel like I've gotten past the point where I no longer want that. Mm. You know, the yeah. casual stuff. Like I, I want the meat and potatoes. I want. Right. I want that. I want a love like, that lasts. Right, like love story like that. That'd be cool. Gosh, when you meet somebody and you're together for that long, mm -hmm. a lot of things have to change, right? But for each individual in the relationship, I'm sure a lot of things change for them. But I, I figured out or just observed that there was one thing, at least, maybe it's that intangible element, uh, that is the same. So it was just it was like that song was born out of this idea of like if my grandmother was still alive or my grandfather didn't have Alzheimer's and I could really have this conversation, mm -hmm. I would want to ask them, what was the same in 1962, the first time you saw each other? Wow, that's And really... then before she passed in 2016, because something, something had to be the same, this, this thing that stands out, this commitment, this love that lasts. You know, I, I think I've heard somebody say this before, but it's, it's, uh, it's this idea that when, you know, when something's when something's broke, you don't just go buy the new one. You know, you like invest in it's fix broke, ain't right. You, you invest it. the time into fixing it because you feel that it's worth the effort. So it's. It, I think that's. If I had to gather, uh, I think they would say something along those lines that it, it's not always pretty. Um, you know, it doesn't. Not literally like, I've heard so many married couples say this. Even ones that've been married for 25, 30 years, it's like, the honeymoon phase wears off, and then you really get into being a partnership. You know, not that you don't, not that like, but it almost becomes more meaningful, like because you're, 
um, you know, physical appearance changes, um, your body limitations happen, you know, health and physical stuff like that. So it's like, well, now you're just invested in one another as like, as partners and right. absolutely, you know, seeing each other through. So when I, I feel like I've heard a lot of dating advice, quote unquote, <laughs> and one that I keep hearing consistently is that when you're seeing something, someone, something, someone that you want to keep dating them, like keep courting them, like the initial yep. stages, you know, because oh, yeah. it is easy and it does wear off when you get used to someone. There's that sense of comfort. Right. That's there. Right. Don't stop that. dating your spouse. Right. Like, exactly. You know, make them, like, you know, I would say this, I wouldn't place any more responsibility in one or the other, but yeah, just, you know. Invest the time, the little things, right? I think that's what they would say yeah, too. The little things, things really matter. You, you know what? Somebody told me he's been married for like, I, I know a couple who's been married. Each of them were married once before, mm -hmm. and they knew each other when they were married one, once before. So they knew each other to, when they were to, married like to, other to, to other spouses. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Then they each got divorced completely, you know, unrelated, mm -hmm. and then they connected. And you know oh. what? You know what the husband told me? No. He Not said. At all. He said, uh, Charles, you know what my wife thinks is sexy? When I empty out the dishwasher and she doesn't have to tell me to. <laughs> and like, here's the deal. That is actually super sexy. It sounds it sounds really quirky and weird and funny, but my stepmom said the same thing about my dad. Like, oh man, I just love it when I walk out on Saturday mornings, your dad's like mowing the lawn. I'm like. Chores. Huh. Chores are where it's at, y'all. So it's like, I'm learning this. There's a, there's a correlation here. Like a lot of love language of women to whom I've spoken is acts of service without being asked totally so just, I just a little pro tip out there for anybody <laughs> just, I, <laughs> it's funny that you said acts of service specifically because <laughs> honestly for me like you know the five love, love languages right? absolutely yeah i think for me acts of services went up because it used to be words of affirmation in quality time but then i realized like people can just tell you things you know it's all right. talk though you yeah know? you gotta back it up exactly not only do you have to talk to talk but you have to walk the walk so say i love you and mean it too yeah exactly that's it exactly so yeah. i think now it's it's like words just don't matter and like acts of service and quality time are like well they lose they lose their meaning top contenders right yeah, exactly. yeah um there's an author that i read named thomas merton who said that if the idea remains an idea then it's not a reality not until you actualize right. it, until you act upon it in any yeah. context, but particularly in a context of relationship or love, even a friendship. It's all just like fluff until you actually back it up with action. So I you, when you say, agree with you. Yeah, right? For you, it's like, mm -hmm. say I love you, but man, when you say I love you and you enter the dishwasher and you randomly pick me up like my favorite, I don't know, sushi or whatever like you like, it's like, wow, this person really means it. So, yeah, but it's so beautiful and that happens too. <laughs> I love how you put it. Actually, that's part of the reason why I love you so much, honestly. <laughs> I feel like you're an amazing friend and, you know, when you want something done or you say you're going to do something, you'd back it up, you know. <laughs> all right. So we haven't talked about Canary. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> sorry talking about relationships yeah, we got and a bunch of random stuff. Grandparents, stories. relationships, and then shampoo. Shampoo, I like, I like yep. it. We got a great That's friend. our whole interview. Um, yeah. Canary... Canary is more like, yeah, probably inwardly focused. It like to start inwardly focused, but one that I hope people can identify with, you know, when you're, uh, yeah. I, I call Canary like my adult puberty song. So adult puberty. Yeah. Yeah. Like so that. psychologists have a word for this. It's I a learned. good oxymoron, I think. Yeah. So, you know, that feeling when you're going, you're going kind of through this phase of just feeling very anonymous and very, um, maybe underappreciated or doing things that are kind of menial and you're kind of wondering like what the purpose of all this is. Like, man, I, I, I have these dreams and these goals and these visions and I'm here doing this. And why? When am I just gonna like break through, you know? So Canary kind of came out of that. Combination of that and then seemingly kind of watching, you know, it's very general to say the watching the world pass you by, but just to put it in real time, I'm 28 right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm at this age now where like a lot of people are having kids, a lot of people are buying homes, a lot of people right. are getting married, totally. uh, getting those promotions and like the career jobs. And it's like, I'm so outside of that right now. Yeah. Um, and I feel that. disclaimer, I'm learning not to shame myself for that, but I nonetheless, 
struggle with you know maybe feeling inadequate or less than or mm -hmm. feeling like I should I be the same way too. Yeah. right like I should be where those people are mm -hmm. so it's it's that's that canary is just like an honest like man like I want to be happy for person X Y or Z but you know I'm just like that's the whole imagery is like what's what the purpose of, an, of a canary who can't sing what's the purpose of a balloon when you can't hold the string like feeling like the one thing that you're meant to do or like that purpose you can't do right. so it's like that's kind of the uh yeah <laughs> that's a, this is a beautiful metaphor because, you know, <laughs> we get caught up in a society that says that we need to get certain things accomplished at certain ages like when you're 18 you should know exactly what you want you know going out of high school right. like in terms of you know finding a career yeah, so yeah you can go to school and get that job you know when you're 21 like you know do you have a license to drink and 25 you can rent a car and you know find the love of your life and settle down and have 2.5 kids you know like there's all these there are all these ages that represent certain things and so I think society like does a great job of saying that if you don't have this tangible thing or intangible thing by this age then you're a failure and like you know What's weird is I was doing that before society told lives. me to. Really? <laughs> it was very intuitive for you? Uh, yeah, the weird thing was is I didn't know society was doing that. I was doing that to myself. Like, I put, like, so many prep, like, due dates and limitations. and It's not, I know it's not great, but. I mean, I, I definitely feel like it's good to have, not necessarily deadlines for yourself, but, like, goals that you want to accomplish within a certain period of time. But at the same time, like, let's say you don't meet them for whatever reason. I feel like people are allowed to be flexible with themselves in order to achieve those things. If that's something that they really want. Um, now, if it doesn't necessarily like fit into your timeline, then mm. you know, like we gotta learn to adjust because hey, life throws a bunch of curveballs, you know. That's that would be the ellipses on that song for sure. Like I think mm. Canary ends on a dot dot dot, mm. and my hope is that I be I would be there. That I would just be content with. You, you want like an exclamation being mark a little, or it's just, be, just being a little, just being a little malleable and more, um, I would say, forgiving of myself because right. the pressure is, uh, it's a, you know, it's a real thing and a lot of it tends to be self-inflicted. So I think my desire with that song is just to be really honest and open about that phase of life. Yeah, honest and open. That's yeah. why I really appreciate your artistry because I definitely feel that. Like you're opening your soul a little bit every time you sing. It's so moving to watch Charles perform. I mean, as you've already seen. Yeah, this, you really this is are. Where I get... I'm, I'm not just like trying to get, feed you a bunch of compliments. No, I know. This is just where I get uncomfortable when people pay me genuine compliments. So. It's okay. I'm the exact same way. I'm the exact same. <laughs> I do way. appreciate it. I've just learned. Um, my guitar instructor in college told me the only appropriate response when somebody takes the time to pay a compliment is thank you. That's the only public response. So I, I'm trying to get better about that, and I'll just say thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here in my home, Charles. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome. <laughs>